Good afternoon and welcome to Dibble's January 2023 webinar. I'm Kay Reed. I'm the executive director of the Dibble Institute, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today to hear our distinguished speaker, Dr. Anita Barbie, who talks about how Love Notes actually prevents pregnancy, <laughs> as opposed to preventing attitudes about pregnancy or, or preventing thoughts about pregnancy. It actually prevents pregnancy. So we're super excited to have you all here. Some brief housekeeping uh, thoughts. One, um, if you can't hear us, please go, you know, the best thing to do is log off and log back in. That'll probably solve it. Sometimes I need to like turn on my volume all the time that actually happens. So put your volume on or alternatively call in. There is a, in the email invitation you got is a um, call in number. So feel free to call in. Secondly, um, we will be uh, asking, or I'm going to be asking you a couple questions to raise your hand. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. And uh, we will get at the conclusion of this, after you complete your survey, you'll get a certificate of participation you need to, in, if you need to prove to somebody that you were working during this hour, which we know you're all busy, busy, busy taking notes. Um, there are two handouts for you that are available. Anita's uh, study that was just published in November on uh, the 12 month data on Love Notes and also a Love Notes sample lesson, uh, Love Notes version four. Um, is in is ready for you to um, to to download from this webinar. So, um, if you would please all please find your hand on your control panel, and raise it if this is your very first very first Dibble webinar. I'll give you a few seconds here. Well, I, I knew when I looked at the list, I recognized a lot of names. So I appreciate you for those of you who we know and uh, welcome you as our prospects and or as our friends and clients. And uh, for those of you I don't know yet, um, welcome, welcome to the Dibble Institute. We're really pleased to have you. So thank you so much. We have, um, yeah, so thank you so very much. All right, next slide, please. There we go. All right. Thanks, Anita. All right. So I, I always start with uh, some uh, reference to Charlie and Helen Dibble. People ask us how we got this funny name, and it's in honor of Charlie Dibble, who started the Dibble Institute. Charlie saw that young people um, were lacking confidence in their long-term relationships, that their parents, sometimes their the young people's trajectories would change if their parents' long-term relationships and marriages um, were faltering and Charlie was an engineer fix it kind of guy and he thought I could I can fix this so um, he decided he talked to the leading researchers of the day and thought that the best way he could help the situation was to uh, translate research into practical teaching tools that then would be made available to others to use next slide and as a result of that um, the Dibble Institute has clients and friends in every state and many territories. Um, and last year, when we do the count, when we did the count, we served over 119 we, royal we, meaning you out there, uh, served over 119,000 youth. It's astonishing. And we're very grateful. It's a very conservative figure. We only count each binder we sell for 30 kids, and we only do it once. So if you taught it once or five times or 10 times, uh, we don't capture that, but we are very sure, we're very confident in 119,000 youth. We're a national independent nonprofit. There's no one behind the screen and there's no profit motive in what we do. So no one's getting rich from this. We just uh, plow any money we have back into the organization, expand our offerings uh, to help more kids. So we're really thrilled to have you on our team. Next slide. Our mission. So our mission is empowering young people around their intimate relationships. We spend a lot of time with young people on other issues. We talk to them about sex. We talk to them about drugs. We talk to them about uh, violence. We talk to them about mental health. And what we've learned is that if you um, help them with their intimate relationships, you actually can touch on each of those things, pregnancy prevention, violence prevention, child abuse prevention. And so that's what we do is really have that narrow focus 
on intimate relationships and young people. It's a, it's you know the whole world of things we need to do with young people. There's a million levers that need to be pulled to be successful, but we think that this relationship skills level lever is super important. Next slide. So some of our key values. Um, we're big fans of research. I mean, Anita's here today to talk about research. We, we sponsor research. We support research. We base our materials on research. Um, and, and so when things change, and they do, because science is never settled, right? I mean, there's a few things that are settled, for sure. Pretty sure we think that the Earth is round. But a good example is uh, COVID. You know, early on, they didn't know how it was transmitted. And so I don't know about you, but I was at the grocery store with my gloves on and washing my groceries when I got home. So, and then they learned that's not how I did it. You know, how, that's how it was transmitted. So science evolves. And so our programs evolve with the science and we just came out with new updates of, of love notes and relationship smarts this last fall and um, are, are really pleased with uh, the reception of what we've gotten you know from people about those updates i um, mean we've we've um, if any research has changed and any findings have changed we've changed it so this also gives you confidence that what you're presenting to young people is current so we're, we're thrilled about that next slide we're also big fans of stable, safe, and nurturing families. Um, and so, you know, there's many ways to have one of those. You could be married, you could be cohabiting, you could be a single mom or dad. Um, but what's really important for kids and outcomes for children is that they are raised in stable, safe, and nurturing families. And some people will choose to get married to have that, other people won't. It's, you know, we're, we just want to make sure kids are in that safe, stable, and nurturing place. And lots of people, want that too for their children they just don't know how to get it and that's where our skills are super helpful um, really for the next generation so that that's another thing that's really important to us and lastly Nita the next slide you know relationship education is for everyone you know it doesn't matter your age doesn't matter your economic status doesn't matter your ethnicity or race or gender identity or sexual orientation you know we can all get better at relationships for sure. And we could all use skills in this area. So we write our materials intentionally to be broad. You never know who's in front of you, especially with young people in a, in, a, in a youth group or in a room, you don't know who's in the room. So we intentionally write our materials to be very inclusive and very welcoming. And in fact, our materials are used widely with varied audiences. So we're really thrilled with that. All righty, next slide. So, I'm pleased to present to you today uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Anita Barbie. Anita is uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, she's at the Kent School of Social Work and Family Sciences at the University of Louisville. Um, and you know what this woman hasn't done, it's, you know, she's a, she's a fellow at the American Association of Social Work and Social Welfare. She's worked for 30 years in the social um, or the child welfare space. She's past president of the International Association for Relationship Research. Um, and uh, she's uh, the mother of uh, two sons, one of whom's getting married this next year. So we had a lively discussion before we got on about her choice in, uh, in mother of the groom dresses. <laughs> so she's a likable, personable person. Anita, you can turn on your camera at any time. Um, but most importantly, I think for you here today is Anita is the person who originally studied Love Notes with the CHAMPS project uh, with uh, federal funding uh, that ended in 2016. And since then, there's been a couple of evaluations, uh, articles that have come out most recently in November. And so we thought it'd be perfect for her to come, especially as TPP funding, teen pregnancy prevention funding is, is opening up later this month, that she come and discuss, you know, look under the hood of the research she did. So Anita, a warm welcome to you. Thanks for, thanks for coming on board. Thanks so much, Kay. I appreciate it. It's great to be here and to see so many people uh, on, on the webinar. I'm going to take one second to make sure I can see my own slides here. There we go. So, yeah, uh, thank you again. I'm at the University of Louisville in Kentucky and uh, talk a little bit about this project. I have to give background. I'm sorry I have to spend some time here, but Everybody doesn't know the study, so I'm going to go ahead and just remind you that way back when Obama was president and he set up the Office of Adolescent Health, which is now the Office of Population Affairs, 
he gave, you know, they awarded over $100 million <clears throat> to do some replication of evidence-based models and to develop new models and test them. And we were part of that tier two uh, and received <clears throat> about um, almost $5 million to test um, uh, innovation. And in Kentucky, at that point, while there had been a drop in teen pregnancy rates, uh, there had still been a sticking point in certain populations of youth, African-American youth, uh, Latino youth, uh, foster youth, LGBTQ youth, and so, and we were, we, we remain high in, in, in having a lot of teen births, especially among African Americans. Um, and so <clears throat> we thought that we were a good place to kind of test out innovation. And <clears throat> what the public health, what the public health field has really focused on the most is the the immediate predictors of pregnancy and they've spent a lot of time looking at in terms of research and, and in terms of developing programming to reduce those immediate things that lead to pregnancy and especially high-risk sexual behaviors like just engaging in sex at all having multiple partners many of whom are older having inconsistent use of condoms and other forms of birth control um, and, and while there's been some attention to, to pieces of relationships in the context, <clears throat> they really focus much more on access to care, access to these kinds of tools, and helping kids escape situations that might lead them to have sex at a particular moment in an un, un, unsafe way. <clears throat> uh, and so <clears throat> really other fields are much more likely to try to understand the social context and a broader set of variables. And I have a PhD in social psychology. I'm in the School of Social Work. My co-major in graduate school is family science. We've now, we've got a, a marriage and family therapy program in our school. <clears throat> we are moving into the family science field. Um, and so I, I bring those lenses to this work that's a little different than the public health. And we really began to, as we looked at all the literature, began to think that that maybe <clears throat> while it's essential to try to get people to change their behavior in these ways, it might not be enough, and particularly for youth who are living in tough environments. So we turned our attention to, to life history theory, that when you're living, you're a population living in high poverty, environments that have a lot of threats, a lot of um, danger, uh, low, a lot of deprivation, a lot of oppression um, through multiple sources and systems, not a lot of opportunity to get out of those environments, that that is kind of a hotbed <clears throat> for <clears throat> driving young people's sense that I might not last very long or I might not succeed in these kind of ways that traditionally we have pushed in our country in terms of work and, and, and taking care of yourself and those kinds of things. And so um, and there's also kind of a biological drive when you're feeling that level of threat to, to want to reproduce. And so it's, it's a unconscious piece that's been, that's been shown in the literature uh, all over the world as a, as a variable. And in our racialized minority, minoritized um, communities, you know, we, we tend to put them all in one spot, um, and 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 they they just face so many so many things with the structural racism has affected values and, and experiences, and so we of course believe it's it's important not to just do teen pregnancy prevention. <clears throat> it's not just in the in the hands of the children uh, to 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 keep this from happening. That you've got to involve families, you've got to involve neighborhoods. The more you can, you know, be in a larger system to make change, the lot more you can build up families and anti-poverty programs and anti-racism programs. All of that's going to help lift up uh, folks in their communities and begin to divert uh, some of this, some of this um, behavior that's not helpful. Um, but many of us, you know, are on the ground. We're in nonprofits. We're in communities, and we want to do what we can with the resources we have 
if we can't change policies at the federal or state level, we can at least give people some tools. And so we think it's important to know that this context matters, but what can we do to at least give some skills and some understanding of these dynamics? And so we really think that the teen pregnancy programs, the more they're kind of based in the reality of the trauma and the stress that kids are under, and giving them some understanding of that and how to manage it and how that affects their choices and their their thinking about their lives, the better. Uh, and to just kind of take out decision making and risk taking outside of that context and outside of all those different pressures is really you know unwise. Um, the other thing is for all youth, um, they're at a developmental stage of you know becoming more differentiated from their parents and their fam their families of origin or their extended families. They're looking to peers more. Um, they want to have intimacy and connection and closeness. We know with social media, it makes you think you have friends or you're close, but it's actually isolated our young people. So we've had almost a decade of, of isolation, lots of pressure online, and kids are feeling quite in despair and not connected. And so while it's always been important for young people, it's especially urgent now to give people, young people, the skills, the, the space to be with other young people, to learn these kinds of things, to help them not only in those personal relationships, but across the spectrum of relationships. But they're really attuned to this. They want to know what works, what, what love is, how, how does all this work? How do I form a relationship? <coughs> Where does sex fit in? Um, how do I navigate all that? And so to, to build that into a, a teen pregnancy program and emphasize it more than just a, a part of a lesson or a module, we thought really would be important just given where they are. So we had kind of a multi-level model approach of why we wanted to look at Love Notes compared to some other programming. Again, this kind of um, anti-racist, you know, structural racism component, the life history, the, the environment, the deprived environment, um, the the personal need to 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 have some some um, efficacy for where your life is going because again if you feel like you're going to make it you feel like you can find a way out of these tough situations you're much more likely to you know focus in on those <coughs> kinds of um, activities that will promote it and maybe not put yourself in these risky situations um, you know. And so Love Notes really incorporates all these components of how do you form a good relationship? How do you know if it's healthy? How do you make your goals come true? How do you, um, you know, lead to that success sequence that leads to great outcomes? <clears throat> and then certainly tapping into those beliefs or helping to shift some of the attitudes about the success and about um, pregnancy at this time um, we thought would be really important above and beyond the typical theories, which are just focused on that planned action. <clears throat> and so um, the OAH way back, you know, 13 years ago, listed all the effective interventions. The more have been added to the list since then. And most of them involve, um, you know, comprehensive sex ed. Obviously, we know that's really critical. It's essential. You've got to teach them everything about how to how to delay, how to protect themselves <clears throat> uh, physically, and reducing the risk <clears throat> was one of those uh, programs that um, had been, had been on the evidence list and um, had been good at delaying sex and helping kids use condoms and sometimes birth control. Um, you know, and so we knew that those risky things were shifted, but we didn't know if it had really made an impact on pregnancy. None of the studies had found that yet. But we knew that that was a good, solid, uh, evidence-based approach. And we wanted to compare that that we already knew worked with um, Love Notes, which really centers relationships at the center and how sex fits into that and into your lifelong planning uh, to see how that would incorporate the comprehensive sex ed within that context and within that understanding of how relationships work in very high stress, traumatized environments, um, how that would do. And so Love Notes did have evidence that it worked 
in helping kids shift their understanding of healthy and unhealthy relationships and how to avoid kind of violence in relationships um, and shifting some of their attitudes about how to how to form relationships. Uh, and then in the first part of what we kind of analyzed for our study uh, that I'm going to describe here, we found that it did, in fact, uh, more than a control group and more than reducing the risk, lower all those high-risk behaviors. It, it delayed kids' onset of sex behavior. It, um, it increased their use of, of a consistent use of condoms and birth control and reduced the number of partners. But then the question is, well, does that, you know, do, do, do they actually have fewer pregnancies? So we wanted to compare this kind of new model to the typical or business as usual that's been tested in the literature uh, against the control, which I'll describe in a minute. So our, you know, we thought that reducing the risk had the potential to reduce pregnancy because it, it does target these high-risk behaviors. So we thought that that would work. And we thought that, of course, love notes would. And we thought, though, that it might work in both, but it's probably going to work better in love notes because it's touching on so many of these other contextual pieces that affect pregnancy. We also wondered how much, you know, Love Notes emphasizes, it doesn't say sex is bad or that you should never have children. They just say, let's delay it. Let's, uh, you know, that right now is not the best time, perhaps, <clears throat> given economics and the need for schooling and, and the skills that have to be developed to be more self-sufficient and to be able to find someone that's a lot like you, that, that takes maturity. So this negative attitude about pregnancy or not wanting to be pregnant at this age is emphasized, or, or it's at least here are all the reasons why this might not be a good idea, and then the kids kind of come to their own conclusion. We don't say it's bad. We, we just kind of lead them along <laughs> to help them understand <clears throat> how this might derail their plans or get them in a pickle or in a situation that they find is, is scary. So how do those kind of attitudes and then the success sequence of, you know, go to school, get some training, find somebody that's really great who you want to, you know, pair with to have kids and then have kids, uh, pushing it into your 20s instead of so young. So we wanted to see how that would, if it would mediate this, if it, if that was a, you know, accelerant to the Love Notes curriculum, if that was one of the reasons why it was working, or if it, it also had direct relationships. So we tested all that in this study. We looked in that, in the CHAMP study at just, um, unmarried youth between the ages of 14 and 19 who'd never experienced a pregnancy. So they were, this was true prevention and not, you know, we could really be kind of very frank about all the things that can happen in ways that once someone's had a child, there's some defensiveness about the whole issue. So we wanted just to see in this kind of a pure uh, preventative environment, how, how would this come across? Um, and then we did it in, we did a cluster randomized because there were some sibling groups that we had to throw into the conditions together. So we had 39 reducing the risk, 39 love notes, and 31 uh, con control groups at these camps that I'll describe in a second. So we ended up treating almost 1,500 kids uh, and testing the effect. We randomly assigned them to conditions. Um, and, and we had pretty good follow through in terms of we we surveyed them at three, six, and 12 months after the, you know, after the immediate follow-up. Of course, had a baseline so we could make sure there was baseline equivalence and, um, you know, good good rates of, of uh, not too much nutrition. It was, you know, uh, uh, young girls and boys were in all the groups. Um, it still skewed a little bit more female. Uh, they tended to be almost 16 years old. Most were on free and reduced lunch. Most were African American because that's who we were really targeting. Although we had some um, uh, Latina and Latino uh, young people um, and some Caucasian or white folks. Um, we did, um, we were, it was in a uh, kind of this urban environment. Um, as we kind of described the, the, the racial and ethnic background, we did have, uh, we had a lot of relationships with organizations that serve refugees. So about 9% of the sample is refugee. Um, we, I, because I work in child welfare and I really see this as really critical in human 
uh, child welfare systems to, through independent living or any means possible, <clears throat> making sure young people in our system get this kind of training because they're three times more likely to experience a pregnancy in their teen years or early 20s while they're still kind of in our care and than other youth. And so they're very high risk as well. And so we engaged um, our uh, child welfare folks and about 15% of our kids were in out-of-home care at the time or had 21% had ever been in out-of-home care. So they've had that kind of trauma history. Uh, and then um, very high numbers of LGBTQ youth, which we didn't really target for this study, but we measured it much higher than the base rate of what we normally think of as the, as the numbers. Um, and so it was a good representative of, of again, that's another high-risk group because uh, they're often forced or they feel like they need to show that they're fitting in the, the mainstream or they're testing things out as they're trying to understand their sexuality. So uh, that was an important group. We, you know, we partnered with 23 community-based organizations, and um, they were in these parts of town you know, uh, that had the refugee services, foster care services. We were neighborhood places, which kind of works with impoverished families throughout the community. Um, and you can see our map, it was kind of concentrated where, because we, we, we're one of the most segregated, racially segregated cities in America. And so you can see that's where a lot of our African Americans are in those two clusters of red dots. Sorry, my dog is barking. I hope y'all can't hear that much. Um, and so uh, that's how we were able to target. Again, it was a three-arm design um, and got good consent randomized at the beginning. We ran these things called Champs Camp. So what the young people said at the beginning is, we don't have time. We do a lot of sports and activities. We can't be, you know, doing this work, coming to your sessions all the time. Please just concentrate it. So we did it over two Saturdays, back to back, um, all day long. We were able to, because it was such a well-funded grant, uh, We were able to give them lots of activities and food and incentives and prizes throughout the day to keep them energy up. And so we were able to, to pull this off uh, across that time. Again, a third of the kids were in reduced risk. Some were in, uh, which is, you know, is again, 16, 45 minute modules. Uh, we did some adaptations by adding some videos about anatomy because kids didn't know anything about the body. Um, and um, with Love Notes, uh, again, you know what it's about. Um, modules, but some of them are longer. Uh, we also uh, added the piece about reproductive anatomy for them at the same time point. Uh, we also made an evidence-based version where we kind of honed in on the key messages and activities in each module you know, uh, Marlene is really great about giving you many, 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 many resources. It's a big, thick manual. There's a lot to cover. We wanted to make sure everybody was covering the same material in every session uh, for evaluative purposes. And so we just kind of honed in on what was most critical. Uh, and then the Power of We was kind of a community-based uh, intervention to empower young people. It gave them something to do in that same period of time that was fun, that taught them about how to change systems, how to work on their community. They did neighborhood walks. They saw the, you know, the cracks in the sidewalk and the abandoned houses. They learned about social action and how to make a difference in their community uh, as a group. Nothing about sex relationships or self-esteem or life planning for them. It was just more about this outer community piece. So it was very compelling, but was it served as a good control. Um, and then we served them, as I said, at the baseline and then immediately post and three, six, and 12 months later, asked a lot of questions. And for this study, we were really looking at, to the best of your knowledge, have you ever been pregnant or gotten someone pregnant? And to your best of your knowledge, have you ever done that in the last three or six months? So at the beginning of the study, we were sure that they were, had never had a pregnancy. And then Usually over two days is not going to be a, an issue, but we, we measured it at every time point. Then at the three-month time point, it was from the time they did love notes where we were sure they had not had a pregnancy. 
in that three month period had they ever experienced one. If the six months was from the three to six month period, have you ever experienced one? And then from the six to 12 month time period, have you ever experienced a pregnancy then? And uh, we also measured attitudes about pregnancy and about uh, as a teen and success sequence. Um, and, and what we really did is we counted all the pregnancies in that, that year after um, the study, you know, the intervention time had ended. Because it's such a low base rate behavior, we just kind of captured once they've gone through this a year later, how many of them got pregnant um, and or impregnated someone. So that's an important point here. This isn't just about focusing on girls and, and making girls the only um, people that we hold accountable for this. It's a, it, you know, two people are involved in, 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 in a pregnancy. Uh, it has a lot of impact on, on, on young women, but, uh, you know, there's a male involved at that point. And so we wanted to know, had the guys done this and had that kind of an impact? Because we wanted them to also be changing their behavior and not just putting it all on the females. So we looked at both. And what we found is that out of the 500 kids, only 18 uh, had either gotten pregnant or created a pregnancy. That was a, about 3.5% pregnancy rate in that year after. Um, <clears throat> and then in reducing the risk in power of we, it was 31 pregnancies and 27, or, around 6, 6.5%. So it was about double the rate. Uh, of love notes and we looked at the differences it was significant between love notes and the power of we and the reducing the risk of the power we were not different from each other uh, and it was uh, close but not uh, not um, significant between love notes and reducing the risk but it was close it was a trend um, so what we saw here was that not only had love notes performed well in lowering r risk it had actually um, you know, produce fewer pregnancies uh, afterwards. Um, there were direct effects of negative pregnancy attitudes and beliefs in success sequence, but there were also, uh, it was stronger in the love notes condition. So love notes was affecting those kinds of uh, thoughts that was mediating the effect. And so for us in, in, in this paper that you've got attached to this webinar, you can read the whole thing. So I just pulled some things from it. What we really saw is that um, love notes did re significantly reduce pregnancy, and um, and we think that that's really important. In our state, that saved them about almost eight hundred thousand uh, dollars in you know medical and other costs just with those few kids. Um, having fewer pregnancies and so that's you know materially very important it it shows some support for love notes and some support for the, just the ways that kids were not that they weren't engaged in the others they were it was very highly the implementation evaluation for all three was very positive kids loved everything that they did but they got different messages that seemed to be Kind of sitting with them and uh, affecting their behavior and, and their outcomes in love notes really differently than in these other other uh, programs. Um, and so putting in that life planning, healthy relationship uh, context we think was important and particularly important for these high risk groups. Uh, and, and we really think that thinking about your future, you know, one of the components is to talk about as you're choosing a partner, you got to understand your own family dynamics and background and context as well as theirs. And there's baggage that we all bring that can be positive and negative in that trip called, you know, romance. Uh, and so they, were, they really have to spend some time thinking about how does that affect my judgment, my views of people, the risks I take in being with different kinds of people, um, how does that affect my, you know, whether I'm going to make my goals or not to do well, to survive, to go to higher education or learn the trade that I really care about. Um, you know, they really had time to think about all those things 
in this kind of larger life context, and we think that that really made a difference. Um, you know, this this uh, shifting of the attitudes that this isn't the time to do it, we thought was really important. We know there's some research that shows that in the African-American community, um, you know, a good thing about the culture is that it's very family-oriented and very much cares about the next generation and welcomes children into their families, and the judgment is is not there. I mean, there's just a lot more positivity when anybody gets pregnant and has a kid, and that is a great thing. Uh, the tough thing is that if you're very young, it kind of can put you behind or have, you know, slows down your ability to go to school and things. It affects those relationships with a partner, et cetera. And so um, really uh, this kind of is a little bit counter to some of the messaging in some communities uh, of, of kind of welcoming this and just says, yeah, we welcome it. You should welcome it. You should really want to, you know, um, we, we value children and family formation also. We're just saying that it's probably, or we're showing you lots of examples of how the longer you kind of wait to do that and, and get back past some of your own goals, the better off you'll, you'll be. Uh, and so they really kind of capture that. Um, <clears throat> all, we think, though, that that combination of both how to prevent pregnancy and STIs as well as why was the critical key. Um, another great thing about Love Notes is, again, we didn't ever say these messages straight out. And any of you who are familiar with the curriculum, it's through videos, and it's the voices of other young people and the stories of young people who, you know, who engage in different kinds of behaviors and, and, and situations, found themselves with diseases or, you know, they got pregnant and then things kind of fell apart with the partner who they thought they really liked. And all those kinds of, of times to think about those scenarios and the, the videos and the music and the art and all the ways that they're engaged and their minds and their hearts and their spirits are, are, are lifted up. Um, and, and the joy of romance and, and love and relationships, but also that there's a, we've got to be cautious all that messaging we think really uh, is important and, 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 and really showed up in this, in this uh, whole set of outcomes in this study. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I kind of went faster than I anticipated I would. Uh, and I don't know if there's a way to have questions through chat or through open things up, but but that's kind of my, my uh, pitch. <laughs> We've got the, the study attached. We, we'll send you out our notes. Um, you've got a sample of the Love Notes lesson so that you can kind of see how it looks. Uh, the Dibble Institute is great about sharing resources so that you can really see if you want to engage in this. Um, you know, we're now a, a small part of a dissemination grant that our local uh, YMCA is engaged in locally in Louisville. They, they they have such a good relationship. They were able to get it into the schools, and they're and they're working having young people be the facilitators of love notes. Um, so the seniors are teaching the freshmen, which brings a whole level of credibility that's even beyond what we were able to do with people in their twenties. Um, they're also embedding it into their camp. <clears throat> You're going to have a whole webinar next month from Kelly from that team who's going to tell you about how they built it into Y camps and then had some extra activities in the afternoons where they could really kind of process what they had learned, not just with a trusted adult, which is also built into Love Notes, but with their using art and creativity to process and to share what they were learning and how Love Notes was really shifting their perspective. Um, and, and so there's a lot of, you know, once we did the science, uh, it, it's been great to see how uh, other organizations, the organizations we've been working with, were able to creatively put it into therapy sessions and in, in residential care communities. Um, you know, do it in these in these true camps at the Y, um, in shelter at the at the safe spaces. I mean, there's just lots of ways that this can be disseminated and lots of creative ways to engage young people. 
Um, but hopefully, you know, seeing some of the some of the evidence um, gives people some reassurance that there's there's something, you know, um, in this that that seems to have heft that that has in a, in a very controlled environment in the field um, makes a difference. So, Anita, I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. Morgan Morgan wants to know. Um, how do, is reducing the risk an abstinence-based curriculum, and how does reducing the risk differ from Love Notes? Um, reducing the risk is not an abstinence-based program. Reducing the risk teaches kids. I mean, they bring in we bring in Richard with, you know, the 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 model of you know uh, to show how to put on a condom, and it, it's very good about teaching all the ways to to prevent. Uh, a pregnancy with birth control and things, they teach them lots of ways to escape situations that they might be in, that they might be tempted to have sex. It teaches them ways to kind of plan ahead so that they won't have sex. And if they do plan to, to do it mindfully and to get the, the condom and the, uh, or the birth control uh, set up. So, and they talk a little bit about relationships, but not much. I mean, it's just like part of a module. Um, and so that that's just a typical comprehensive sex ed program of, of reducing the risk. Whereas Love Notes also includes, we had several modules. Hold on just a second. We had several modules in Love Notes that talks about, you know, um, all about birth control, all about condom use, all about how to, you know, to be safe physically as well as emotionally with folks. Um, where sex fits into relationships, um, what are the kinds of things that, you know, can facilitate safety that can, you know, lower risk. And again, we, we put a lot of this into the, a lot of these relationships, a lot of where, where things go wrong is, is violence in relationships and control. And it's older guys with younger girls kind of controlling them and pressuring them to do things they're not ready for, they don't necessarily want. Or they don't realize that, you know, they talk them out of using these kinds of preventative things. So we talk about all of that. We talk about consent. So it's very, it's very clear about the sexual pieces and, and how it's better to have fewer partners, et cetera, just like reducing the risk. But it's, it's just contained within this larger context of navigating relationships generally and communicating what you want and how to kind of communicate in a way that, um, helps your message be clearer and and helps you see that you might be in a relationship with somebody who isn't god doesn't have your best interest at heart and might try to you know manipulate you or do something uh, in this context of sex or just in the relationship not honor your you as a person or value you or respect you and how do you escape those kinds of situations that could ultimately become quite dangerous and, and violent and so it's just that it's that framing is different, even though some of the content is similar. If that helps, that does. Okay, so I have another question from King Lee Queen Lee. Excuse me if I mispronounce your name. <clears throat> Did the seventy-six uh, pregnancies lead to live births, and is there any plan to study those teen parents? Oh uh, yeah, I probably should have done that. Uh, <laughs> No, we were just interested in did pregnancy occur, so we we asked about that. We didn't. Now Kentucky is is a red state, very conservative. Uh, even at the time of this study, I think there was only maybe two abortion clinics in the whole state. And even though they're in Louisville, it costs money. And I, you know, we didn't promote that uh, in this program. Um, and so I don't know how many of them actually did something. You know, other than we know that there's more pregnancies than there are live births in Kentucky. We do know that. And so there may have been some other behaviors that people engaged in that, that kept that from happening. Um, but, you know, we were really more emphasizing just to kind of keep this from happening and not having to make that decision, um, which is both costly and, you know, it's emotional, even yeah. though there's no doesn't necessarily lead to any emotional damage or anything it's still just quite difficult and and, and in, in states like ours and of course now after Roe has been uh, is gone um, it's very difficult in many places for folks to do this so that would have been great we should have but we didn't look at it 
Okay. Well, and you were, you know, this, this, as you say, this, you were funded to do teen pregnancy prevention, innovation, not yeah. anything else. So if you could just be mindful and keep your phone a little lower because it's getting in the way of your face. Um, and so um, how were you able to get the large return of follow-up surveys? Um, we had these things called data days, D-A-Z-E, like you're in a daze. <laughs> And we had them at the centers where the kids had come to do love notes or the, the schools where we had done it after school on the weekends. Um, and so the young people, we, we brought the surveys kind of to them and to their areas of town or their neighborhoods or the places where they frequented. Um, and we, we did a lot in the beginning to make sure we had multiple contacts for every young person. We knew who their mama was, who their auntie was, who their best friend was so that we had multiple ways of finding them we, we found them through we had Facebook connections to them we we had the ability to text them to phone them to email them to send them you know flyers and we just had a big team of people who spent a lot of time connecting with and building kind of relationships with the youth to keep them kind of incentivized we fed them at those uh, sessions if kids couldn't make it to the session, we did one-off um, survey administrations at the agencies uh, or in the community in a, in a kind of open public safe space. Um, so we, you know, we made sure that, um, you know, we told them how important it was. You know, just as Love Notes is evidence-based, we really kind of played up the whole thing that they were contributing to science uh, and to helping other young people that understanding how things work. Um, uh, in, in, in all the different things they were engaged in. Um, we didn't really give them a lot, a lot of understanding of that they were in a randomized trial or anything like that, but just understanding their reactions to things was important for the future. Um, so they felt like some sense of responsibility to kind of be part of this thing. They were excited about that piece. Um, and, you know, we didn't say we cared what their attitudes were or what they told us about, but just understanding how these kinds of programs affect them that, that gave them voice and so um kind of that empowerment piece the feeding them we gave them incentives because remember this is five million dollars so they got money every time they took a survey a gift card basically so it was safe they couldn't buy anything illegal with it it was just like to a mall and um making it kind of engaging and really persisting to get them so once, uh, Anita, you told me that you thought the secret sauce could be that Love Notes helped connect disconnected youth, helped them build connections. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So built into Love Notes is this uh, making sure that every young person has a trusted adult that they could talk to about what's going on in the program. So every module has some questions for their trusted adult that they were to talk to their trusted adult about. Now, even though we truncated the time and they would cover, you know, six sessions each time, um, we highlighted that. And at the beginning, we made sure everybody had someone that they could talk to, whether it was a, a parent or a teacher or a counselor or a coach or a, a state worker, if they were in the child welfare system or a foster parent or a granny, somebody. And we made sure everybody had found and identified who that person was. And then as we gave those instructions, we reminded them before they left to go and talk to those folks about what they had learned. Uh, they, we gave them those prompts so that they could kind of have the conversation. So that built that kind of, con that level of connection. Then within the classroom, we usually had about 15 kids in every class. That's a pretty optimal size. If it's too small, it might feel a little awkward if it's too big, then kids don't really feel like it's a safe space where you can be intimate and really talk about what goes on in your life. Um, it, the way the curriculum is, is delivered, there's a facilitation of kind of getting in small groups or dyads to talk about scenarios and to share with the group what they're learning. And so there was lots of engagement built into the curriculum that helps them get to know each other, to build some sense of safety, to see that we're all in this together. Uh, it's important for girls and boys um, who are heterosexually oriented to hear from each other 
because there's a lot of misconceptions and myths that go on within the co-cultures uh, of gender. Uh, that's important. Uh, you know, so, you know, all those things we think, um, as well as having a very inclusive environment in terms of background, in terms of race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, etc., cetera, uh, a, a very safe space so that that built those connections. They got to practice the skills of listening and of get, making a good complaint and of, you know, talking about how to break up with somebody. They got to practice those skills in the class with their peers. So we think that that, um, you know, helped. In our second study where we um, – we got a FISB grant, a SRAE grant. We added a module on um, suicide prevention because we think, you know, we know that when kids break up, they're at high risk for suicide. And, and so we just kind of emphasize that within that module. We just add a little bit more information of, you know, and if you feel really depressed and upset about a breakup or about a relationship didn't go well or about the fact that you were, you know, battered in a relationship, all those things can be kind of predictors of, 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 of suicidality. You know, talk to your trusted adult, reach out to us, here are all the hotlines, here are the places you can go. And we found a drastic reduction in suicide ideation, suicide attempt, um, and other, um, you know, aspects of suicidality from before to after. So we think that part of that was due to that connection in the classroom with the adult uh, and, and getting those relationship skills that that supports this mental health piece. So um, that's some evidence for that connection. Great, thank you. Uh, someone just asked, and I'll take this question, is, um, uh, is, is this, how about using this with teen parents? And I will say that Marlene has included content Anita did not study this with teen parents. Marlene includes content for teen parents. And so it's a really great program for teen parents because there's so many teen parents who have second children and you're trying to get them to think about delaying their next child so they can get through school, get a job, you know, get a foot up. So it's been used widely around the country with teen parents. Um, I will mention, because I've been looking at, the, um, at, at, at your, some of your registration comments, we know that the teen pregnancy prevention tier one grants are going to be released. Well, okay, we know that's a big word. We believe that they're going to be released at the end of this month. That's what um, the Office of uh, Population Affairs has told us. And these are, um, they're going to award 68 grants for five years, up to a million dollars a year. You know, if you only need $500,000 a year to do a program, then they can award more. So it's uh, back in, um, back and forth uh, depending on how many apply we would encourage if you're a, an organization that can handle a federal grant and that you know there's a lot that goes into having a federal grant um, but if you could handle it or you want to be able to um, to handle one it's a it's a good thing to do uh, the Dibble Institute will send out uh, information as soon as we see the grant drop and we'll start reading it you can start reading it and then we'll post a um, based on the requirements of the grant, we'll post a toolkit on our website. Um, if you, right now, if you go under free resources, toolkits, you'll see we've started one. What we know now is that they want programs that are evidence-based and um, have a positive youth development framework, both of which uh, Love Notes has. So we'd be happy to come alongside you um, and, and, and support you in you writing a really great grant to address um, to, to prevent teen pregnancy because I mean think of anything in the world that is 46% better because you did it for you know like that's amazing I mean I maybe brushing your teeth has that same capacity but um, you know in, in social science it's it's really remarkable and Anita and her team did an incredible job of planning this um, this this approach and this very comprehensive and good um, uh, evaluation. And we're really pleased with that. Marlene has done amazing work in keeping it fresh and up to date and, and really so it flows well and it's easy to do. So um, we encourage those of you who uh, want to, to apply for, um, for that funding. Okay, any other questions? I think we're good. Um, 
Uh, Pamela has a question about, so Anita, what kind of, so you say, you know, we have a zillion partners. So just what kinds are they? Like Salvation Army, YMCA, you know, who, who are you working with? We, we work with, um, before the Y, um, we were working with um, uh, refugee resettlement agencies that were working with young people who'd been here a while, who had good English, um, because they're kind of the head of their families, and we wanted to make sure that they had some good um, wraparound of how to kind of survive in our culture. Um, we thought this would be helpful for them. We work with... Um, uh, we have in our state, we still have residential care for kids in, in the foster care system. So we work with those agencies. We work with um, just DCBS, our, our Department of Community-Based Services that does child welfare with their foster families and independent living to have those kids come. We work with um, uh, small nonprofits, after school time, youth serving organizations, both in churches. We were in a lot of black churches. Um, they really saw the importance of this and the need for it. Um, so we've been in, in, in almost every kind of social service agency you can think of. We serve uh, former juvenile justice youth in a second grant um, who are in the community doing kind of educational pieces. We've not, we did a little bit in the actual juvenile justice setting, but not, not much, not in this study. Okay. Okay. But now the Y has really given us a lot of good um, like entree did, to all those organizations. Sounds like you did a great group, great work with both um, government and nonprofits. And and um, Pamela, if you have more questions, we're happy to yak privately. But we need to move on because everybody's going to run out of the room in four minutes. Um, we'll have this webinar up in, in the next few days, along with all the slides in a PDF. So please, you know, come on back. We'll and share it with your friends. Um, happy to. Happy to have it widely used. Next slide, please. Um, so a bonus webinar, because having one webinar enough sometimes just isn't enough. So those of you who are really interested in what's in Love Notes itself, uh, in two weeks from today, Marlene Pearson, um, our beloved author of both Love Notes and Relationship Smarts Plus, will go over what is updated, new, and changed in the new programming. So stay tuned for that. It's on our website. You can register right there on our website. And I hope you all show up for that. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Anita. Oh, well. Okay, I'll just tell you. Um, so the next slide was going to tell you what uh, our webinar is for February. As Anita said, there's this uh, woman, Kelly, um, from the YMCA who's gonna talk about how they're implementing Love Notes in a YMCA context, but it could be in any after-school program or they're using, they're in some schools, they're doing things after school, they're working with some LGBTQ youth. And so um, it's, a, it's more of a practical on the ground kind of thing. Um, so that is also on our website and or it will be in a few days, not quite yet. And you can register for that as well. Um, you'll all be added to our newsletter list, but you know, if you like, uh, connecting in alternative ways. Of course, we're on LinkedIn and Facebook and all those kind of things. Um, I, I put my, my email in the chat box uh, with some questions. If you have questions about this, questions about the upcoming funding, um, how we can support you in doing this important work with young people, please let us know. Um, I, would, I would steer you towards, we have an infographic on our website showing all the ways that relationship skills impacts young adults violence prevention, pregnancy prevention, mental health. And so as you're making partners, it's good to know what their needs are and how a program like Love Notes can help them solve the problem they want to solve, which may be slightly different than the problem you want to solve. In any case, I wish you all well. If you're in California, stay dry and have your life jacket handy. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Northern California myself. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we see Marlene. And then again, second Wednesday in, uh, in uh, February when we learn about um, how they're using love notes in the YMCA of Louisville. So take good care and have a good rest of your day.